Sergeant Daniel Knipe was a United States Army soldier who served in the 7th Cavalry Regiment during the Battle of Little Bighorn on June 25, 1876. He was a member of Company C and played a significant role in the battle. Knipe was one of the few survivors of the battle and was known for his bravery and eyewitness account of the events. He was also a key witness during the Court of Inquiry into the battle, providing valuable testimony about the actions of Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer and the 7th Cavalry. After the battle, Knipe continued to serve in the Army and later wrote about his experiences at Little Bighorn. His account, The Knipe Story, is considered an important historical resource for understanding the battle. Sergeant Daniel Knipe's actions during the Battle of Little Bighorn demonstrate his courage and dedication to duty, making him a notable figure in American military history. But before we begin, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel to support our community. On May 17, 1876, we were sent out on what would turn out to be a most unfortunate expedition. We set off toward the Yellowstone River. We marched 12 miles to the Big Heart River and made our camp there. We stayed for a while looking around at our surroundings. By about June 10th, we moved on up to the Powder River. Six companies out of the 12 were sent out on a scouting mission. Leaving the wagon train at the Powder River, we took 10 days rations on pack mules and traveled up the Powder River for two days. Then we turned toward the Tongue River and it was along the Rosebud River that we discovered the Indian Trail. As the sun began to set, we prepared a little coffee, then marched along the trail all night long. In the morning, we made more coffee and set out up the trail once again, marching until noon. General Reno, who was in command of this detachment, noticed that our 10-day rations were running low, so we turned back down the Rosebud River. At the junction of the Rosebud and the Yellowstone, we met the other six companies of the regiment, led by General Custer. General Terry, the commander of the department, was present. General Custer was under arrest. It was said that this was due to his attitude against the post traders who had been given concessions at the various posts, which had been taken away after scandals regarding post traderships during President Grant's administration. Those traders had arranged things so that one could not buy anything at the post without getting it from them. A glass of liquor cost 25 cents, and the servings were mostly just a little bit, very little whiskey. Custer had set a maximum price, which led to his arrest. However, many high-ranking army officers were with him, and he was given a command at the place I mentioned. On July 22nd, Custer's group received 15 days rations from the steamboat far west that was on the river. There were two Rodman guns and two Gatling guns with Custer. He thought he could manage without them, so he gave them to General Gibbon, who took them across the river. In hindsight, we see this as a mistake, for if he had kept one of those Rodman guns and fired it just once, those Indians would not have stopped running. Not at all, they would still be fleeing. And if we had had a Gatling gun there, there would have been many more survivors than just me. In fact, there would never have been a Custer massacre. On June 22nd, we broke camp and set out, marching all day long. That evening, Custer gave orders that there would be no more bugle calls and only enough fire to make coffee, and that commands would be given by hand signals. On the morning of June 23rd, we started out again. We marched until nearly nightfall, then set up camp and continued on the next morning, June 24th. That day, we came to a place where the Indians had held a sun dance and had staged a war dance too. They had built brush shelters from the cottonwood trees and the ground was padded down smooth and hard from their dancing. Six Crow Indian scouts who were with our regiment had gone ahead and found the scalp of a white man. It was from a soldier with Gibbon's command. Well, when those Indians who hated the Sioux we were hunting found that scalp hanging on a willow twig, they sure got excited. They cut up in general, yelling and hollering and dancing around. What did they want? If they had found a Sioux there, it would have been a bad day for him. They were that mad. They brought the scalp back to General Custer, who passed it around to the men after looking at it. Sergeant Finley, the oldest line sergeant in my company, had it in his saddle pockets when he was killed. We marched all day on June 24th. The Indian scouts that had been sent ahead returned that night around 10 o'clock. It was quite dark then. You know, in the summer in that area, you can see well enough to read at 9 o'clock. We received orders that night to saddle up and pack our gear. We marched all night, getting close to the junction of the Rosebud and the Little Bighorn Rivers. 
General Custer led the regiment into a ravine that seemed like a good place to stay hidden for as long as we wanted. However, as we rode in at a hard trot and gallop, Quartermaster Sergeant Hurst lost some hard bread from the packs of the pack train. When General Custer learned of this, he ordered the sergeant to go back and retrieve the bread. When the sergeant reached the spot where the bread had fallen, he found two Indians helping themselves to it. They ran off when they saw the soldiers coming. When he returned to camp, he reported this incident to General Custer, who then ordered us to saddle up. I figured that he had planned to surprise the Indians the next morning, but since they already knew we were there, he decided to act now. We marched up the divide and halted. General Custer took the chief trumpeter, Henry Voss, and two scouts and was gone for two hours. When he returned, he divided the regiment into three detachments. He gave Major Reno three troops, A, M, and G. Captain Benteen received three troops, H, K, and D, while Captain McDougal was put in charge of the pack train with Troop B. Custer kept Troops C, E, I, and F for himself. After leaving that place, we moved out. Major Reno was to the left, alongside General Custer, with Captain Benteen to the left of Major Reno. It was clear that the plan was to strike the Indian camp from three directions. Captain McDougal was to bring the pack train up the main Indian trail. We galloped down what is now Benteen's Creek, reaching a crossing where we found an abandoned Indian camp on the other side. The fires were still smoldering. There was a dead Indian in one of the teepees that was still standing. General Custer ordered the teepee to be set on fire. Major Reno came into view and was signaled to cross Benteen Creek, which he did. General Custer, with three companies, pushed down the creek. When we got within a quarter of a mile of the junction of Benteen's Creek with the Little Bighorn, I spotted Indians on top of the bluffs overlooking the river. I said to First Sergeant Bobo, There are the Indians. At that moment, General Custer raised his head, and we, Troop C, I, and F, headed for the bluffs where we had seen the Indians. Tom Custer, the General's brother, was the captain of my Troop C. We rode hard, but when we reached the top, the Indians were gone. However, we could see the teepees for miles around. The Crow Indian scouts with our group wanted to sneak down and grab a few ponies. Some of them did try to slip down, but they got shot for their efforts. Chief Scout Mitch Buey, Curly, a Crow, and Bloody Knife Reeve, who was a Re or Urukura, stayed up on the bluffs with us. Well, when the men of those four troops saw the Indian camp down in the valley, they began to holler and yell, and we galloped along to the far end of the bluffs where we could swoop down on the camp. I was riding close to Sergeant Finkel. We were both near Captain Tom Custer. Finkel shouted to me that he couldn't keep going. His horse was giving out. I called back. Come on, Finkel, if you can. He fell back a bit. Just then, the captain told me to go back and find McDougal and the pack train to deliver orders that had just come from General Custer. Tell McDougal, he said, to bring the pack train straight across to high ground. If the packs get loose, don't stop to fix them. Cut them off. Hurry up. There's a big Indian camp. I headed back. I thought that was tough luck, but it turned out to be my salvation. If Sergeant Finkel had not fallen back a few minutes earlier, he would have received the orders, and I wouldn't be here telling this story. Far off in the distance, I saw the dust rising like a little cloud from the pack train. I moved toward that while my company and the others went on down toward the Indian camp. I remember the last words I heard General Custer say. The men were on the hill, and we all gave them three cheers while riding at a full gallop. Some of them couldn't hold their horses, galloping past General Custer. He shouted at them, Boys, hold your horses. There are plenty down there for us all. They rode on, and I rode back. Reaching the pack train, I delivered the orders to Captain McDougal and then continued on toward Captain Benteen, as I had been told to take them to him too. McDougal and his men rode up to the top of the hill to reinforce Major Reno as he was pulling back from the bottom of the bluffs. The Indians were right behind them, shooting and yelling, and men were falling here and there. The Indians would jump on them and scalp them before we could save them. Dr. DeWolf was killed just as he reached the top of the hill. If he had made it just a few feet further, he would have been saved. As I went back after Captain Benteen, I spotted some Indians running along. I thought they were hostile and got ready to shoot a few rounds before they got to me, but they turned out to be scouts trying to escape from the big battle going on. 
They had come from Major Reno's command and were so scared that they didn't stop until they reached the Powder River. After delivering the orders to Captain Benteen, I rode back to the top of the ridge with the battalion, where we joined the others under Major Reno and McDougal. The Indians were between us and General Custer, so I couldn't join my company. Major Reno began to march out on the range of bluffs to attack the Indians, but they came at us, and we had to pull back and form skirmish lines. Before we could do that, we lost several men, and they were scalped before we could reach them. The Indians shot at us all day, and then at night, they held a meeting until dawn on the 26th. When morning came, they charged at us again, shooting. We managed to kill many of them, though I do not know how many. We were cut off from water, and there were 68 wounded men in camp. A wounded man wants water badly, and it was pitiful to hear their groans as they called for it, but we couldn't get any. Some men tried to go for water, but got shot, and had no luck bringing any back for the wounded. I remember the very first shot that rang out in that two-day battle. It zipped right under my horse's belly and struck the ground nearby. There were 14 men and two officers, Lieutenant Harrington and Lieutenant Sturgis, who were never found. People said the Indians had cut off their heads and dragged them around while they celebrated during the night. In total, 56 men from our group were killed on the hill by the Indians. The shooting continued all day on the 26th. By late evening, we noticed the camp starting to move. The warriors kept firing at us, while the women were busy packing everything up. When the morning of the 27th arrived, there wasn't a single Indian in sight. We managed to get some water, made coffee, and did our best to help the wounded as much as we could. Around 10 o'clock, General Gibbon and his troops arrived. General Terry, the department commander, came along with him. When General Terry showed up, we greeted him with loud cheers. He was very emotional and cried like a baby. He then told us he had seen 200 men in the valley below, which made us realize that General Custer and the four companies had been completely wiped out. We had hoped that maybe he had just been trapped like we were. Later in the afternoon on the 27th, Captain Benteen went to the battlefield, and I was allowed to accompany him and look around wherever I wanted. As I looked over the bodies, I recognized several friends and a sergeant I knew. I spotted Sergeants Finkel and Finley among the dead. Sergeant Finley was lying at the head of his horse, Carlo, with 12 arrows sticking out of him. They had been lying there for two days under the sun, bloody and mutilated. You could tell which men had been wounded because the little Indians and the women would always shoot them full of arrows or hit them in the face with tomahawks after taking their clothes off. They never harmed the dead, only those who were still alive. Among all these bodies, not a single one had any clothes left on them. The Indians had taken everything. They must have gotten around $25,000 in cash from them, too, because we had just been paid at Powder River Camp before we left on this campaign, and there had been nothing to spend our money on. I saw where the last ones fell. They were in a small heap. General Custer lay across a couple of men, with just the small of his back touching the ground. The dead were thick around him. He had been shot straight through the heart. My captain, Tom Custer, who was the brother of the general, was near this last group, as was his brother-in-law, Lieutenant Calhoun, who was in charge of H Troop. In that battle, there were around 4,000 Indians, not counting the women, which brought the total number of Native Americans involved to between 12,000 and 15,000 altogether. It was an overwhelming force that Custer and his men faced. After Custer and his four companies were defeated, there was not a single living being left on the battlefield to tell the tale. Only one horse survived the carnage, a horse named Comanche who belonged to Captain Keogh. When Comanche was eventually found, he had seven bullet wounds in his body. Many dead Indians were also discovered among the fallen soldiers. We found three standing teepees with about 75 Indians inside, and there's no telling how many more bodies were taken away when the Native American camp moved on. I came across one Indian who had been wrapped in blankets and buffalo robes. When I cut him out, I was shocked to find he had a string of scalps as long as my arm, including four women's scalps, two of which had long red hair. It was a gruesome sight, and I quickly dropped the scalps. I didn't want to be carrying around such a disturbing trophy. After the battle, they buried our dead comrades and then began the difficult task of transporting the wounded to the far west steamboat. 
The steamboat had come up the river as far as it could, but then had to back down to the Yellowstone River. Many of the wounded soldiers were loaded onto the steamboat to receive medical attention. Miraculously, most of the wounded men recovered from their injuries. Old Comanche, the sole survivor of Custer's ill-fated battle, was one of them. There was even an order from General Headquarters that this horse would have a box stall for the rest of his life as a symbol of what happened that fateful day. One soldier from the 7th Cavalry Band was assigned to look after Comanche, and during dress parades, the horse would be led at the front of the regiment, draped in a black mourning cloth. As for the Indians, they simply packed up their camp and moved on after the battle. My regiment, which had also been involved in the fighting, was in no condition to pursue them. We were all too badly injured and shot up to mount any kind of effective counterattack. The Indians had won a decisive victory and were able to escape without further bloodshed. I hope this first-hand account gives you a new perspective on the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Great Sioux War of 1876. Stay tuned for more videos like this. I hope to bring you more first-hand accounts of different battles. So have a great day, and I'll see you next time.